Howdy folks, welcome to Camera Shake, where we bring you the insider scoop on all things photography and videography, giving you a unique opportunity to stay ahead of the curve. We've spent literally hundreds of hours interviewing some of the most renowned photographers of our time, giving you access to knowledge and expertise that's not available anywhere else. As always, I'm your host Kirsten Nuss, and in today's episode, we're going to deep dive into branding for photographers. Now, no matter whether you're a professional and fear that AI is lurking around the corner, poised to snatch your job, or you're just having fun creating awesome images and want to make a splash in the world of photography, your branding is absolutely essential. So buckle up, grab a cold one, and let's shake it up with today's guest right after this. <laughs> Welcome to Camera Shake Podcast, episode 152. But wait up, hold on a second, press pause. Well, actually, don't press pause because uh, then you won't hear what I'm about to say. So before we get into today's episode, I have one small favor to ask of you. If you enjoy this podcast, please join the Camera Shake community over on camerashakepodcast.com so that you're the first ones to know when we've got some exciting news for you. You'll find the link in the description, or if you're watching on YouTube, it'll be right down here somewhere on the screen unless I forget to put it there. <laughs> but without further ado, let's give it up for today's special guest, the Dallas-based lifestyle family photographer, business coach, and fellow podcaster, Brittany Rennie. Brittany, man, how are you? Hi, how are you? I'm oh, very I'm... good. Are you good? <laughs> I'm good? I forgot to answer that part of the question. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Cool. So yeah, despite different time zones, we did manage to uh, to get it together today. So it's uh, brilliant to have you on the show. It's really, I'm excited to be here. You are a lifestyle family ph photographer. W what's a lifestyle family photographer? Well, it's, um, I think lifestyle is a pretty general term these days. I feel like a lot of people say lifestyle. Um, I try to be a little bit more of like a guided documentary photographer. So definitely not someone who just is a fly on the wall who takes pictures of families. I kind of guide them into a pose or a moment or a situation and then I let their connection unfold. I've seen on your and your bio that um, you describe yourself as an introvert with extrovert tendencies. <laughs> I, I, do, I, have, I can I can be an extrovert when I want to be. But then when I come home, I am um, kind of crawl under the covers. And my friends like to send me memes and gifts about people who don't want to go out and um, who would rather cancel plans and stay home. Uh, that's definitely that's definitely me. <laughs> yeah. And so you're also a business coach, um, which is really, uh, really quite interesting. So you, you basically, you help people develop or set up or develop their photography businesses. Yeah, I, yeah, specifically I'm a business coach or productivity coach for photographers. I really aim to help specifically women and moms who are trying to build a business in less time. Like I, ideally we would not spend 40 hour work weeks trying to build our photography business. It'd be more like 15 hours of work because we're busy <laughs> and being a mom and being a business owner is it's no easy task that's for sure it's also i guess you know for a lot of people i would have i would think um you know a lot of people start with photography on a part-time basis and yeah. then of course you know running a part-time business on top of maybe your you know your your nine to five job or or you know running running family life with kids and all the rest of it you know that in itself is taxing um but right. then also like making that making that jump from part-time or from a big, from a side hustle to full-time job. That's a really tough, tough decision to make. It really is. I, uh, personally, I started being a photographer before I had kids, before I even had a full-time job. I was still in college and I picked up a camera and I was like, this will be easy. And, um, little did I know it was not easy. <laughs> it was not easy. Um, so then I went to college. I finished college. I got a full-time job. It wasn't nine to five necessarily, but it was 40 hours a week. And I would do photography kind of on the weekends. Um, and then I had kids that so I was trying to be a part-time photographer with kids with a full-time job. I can't, I can't even like wrap my brain around that anymore, but he was little at the time. So he didn't have all these extracurricular activities that I was trying to bounce around to either. So it was a little easier. And then I quit my job to be a quote, stay at home mom. And that lasted in three months. And, uh, my photography business like blew up and just kind of took off from there. So I was, I did not do a very good job at trying to be a stay-at-home mom. Yes, yeah, so it's really quite difficult to manage all these things, you know, and 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 get all of that, you know, get all that done in a in a like in a, in a typical work week. You know, it's like I, I mean, I, I know what it feels like because you know, for for just like a lot of people, you know, I started the business side of photography more uh, as a part-time 
sort of endeavor as a side hustle. And then, of course, you find yourself working late nights and weekends, and you know you get very little sleep, and it's it's yeah, it's tough. Bringing your computer to hair appointments to edit while you're there, and the park, and all all over the place, trying to like fit it all in. And my goal is to help people not have to do that. You know, be able to do it in 15 hours a week or less. <laughs> yeah, that's the that's the thing. You know, and the I think the difficult balance there is sometimes when you look at sort of certain. Um, time-saving solutions like you know things like can you know things like like i don't know software applications or you know or things that can they can save you a lot of time but of course then they cost money and so you're gonna have to b- balance that with actually getting the jobs to make the money to afford to spend it on on things that can that can make your life easier so it's kind of sometimes it's a, it's a bit of a catch-22 i know i feel like the more more i make the more i spend um uh... Like where where is my money going? I don't feel like I'm making any more now that I'm making more. So I'm spending money to make my life easier. <laughs> yeah, that's that's exactly it. And you know, I find the same thing. Um, but of course, what you get back in return is actually time. You know, that yeah. you can then spend on the things that you want to do. You know, for instance, I mean, I say on on things that you want to do, like things like you know, spending time with your family and so on. But especially when you run a business as a like a one man band or a one woman band, then it's important to put some time into marketing, but that's where the conundrum is very often. You go out shooting, you spend your time shooting and editing, and so you, you're happy that you get a lot of jobs in, but then you don't have a lot of time for, for marketing. And then again, you're back in the same catch-22 where it's like, okay, well, I need to market, so I need to, you know, in order to get more jobs, but but I also need to go and shoot and, you know, and edit and deliver and all the rest of it. It's, it's really, is quite difficult to to run a business in general, I think. Right. I think, and then it goes into like having boundaries, like not taking, for me as a family photographer, I can only take so many sessions a week and still balance my life and get all the other parts of the business that need to happen. So, you know, there's weeks where, or months at a time that I've taken way too many sessions. Then I'm like, I have no life and I have no time to even edit because I'm out there shooting the whole time. So laying down those boundaries for myself um, has been a bit of, I mean, I won't take more than two a week, really. Maybe three, um, if I want to feel if I feel like being busy, but two is really my max each week. It's really difficult to set these boundaries, so that's what I found. <laughs> it's really yeah. hard. For sure. So today we're gonna to talk predominantly about branding. Um so my first question is just generally for those uh for those listeners and even for those of you who are watching on YouTube, um, if you're not really familiar with, you know, what branding entails, let's just break it down a little bit. So what is branding and, and why is it important for photographers? Well, I feel like when people hear branding, the first thing they think is, oh, my logo, right? Like that's almost what everyone's like, oh, my logo is my brand, right? Or the way my photos look. I I hear that a lot too. People are like, oh, this is what my brand is. And it's so much more than that. Your logo probably isn't going to sell your photography services unless you are someone like Chanel, you know, like your logo is good, but it's not going to be the reason people are booking with you. They're going to be working with you because of what your brand actually is. And your brand is, I I like to say it's your personality, your brand's personality, your business's personality. So what your business, like how you communicate with your clients, how you work together during a session, um, your emails leading up to pre-session workflows and things like that, that is really what your brand is, like what you stand for, what end result you're able to give them is your brand. So uh, how can... How can you, as a photographer, how can you identify your own sort of brand identity or, you know, your own unique brand identity? Well, brand identity, or do you want to talk about like what the actual brand is? Do you want to talk about the logo or do you want to talk about the actual personality of the brand? I think, okay, so let's start about the personality of the, let's talk about the personality of the brand first, because I think that can then quite easily lead to all the the visuals that right. that come with it. I don't think, I absolutely don't think you can come up with the brand identity, which is your logo. So your brand identity is the logo, your colors, like the the overall aesthetic is your brand identity and your brand would be the personality. You can't come up with that identity yet because you need to know what you actually stand for, like what your, what your photos convey and what they do. So how, how can you figure that out? I always like to start with goal setting. Like what do you want your business to do for you? And that kind of goes into like, what does success look like for each person? My idea of success looks a lot different than probably your idea of success. Um, at one point, I thought it, making over um, six figures was my idea of success. But I get there and I'm like, well, that didn't accomplish what I thought it was going to accomplish. 
So now my new version of success is how can I balance being a mom and being a photographer, running a photography business. So I kind of like dove into what my ideal life is going to look like. It's not spending every day working. Um, spending time with my family, spending time with my kids, going on vacations, traveling, having a house out in the middle of the country. Like those, that is my goal for life. And that's what I want photography to do for me. So that would be the first place to start because I think your business needs to serve your life and not the other way around. Yeah, it's very easy to, to get. It's easy to fall into this trap of, you know, um, of turning your life into your work rather than rather than uh, having the work serve your life, I guess. Yeah. So, I mean, you start with what your goals are and then you kind of work backwards from there. So how much do you want to be working? How many, what kinds of photos do you want to take? What is this, like, what is going to fill you up? Like what kind of sessions, like what kind of photography do you do? So I'm a headshot photographer. So a headshot right. and portrait photographer, that's what I do. Um, so I, that I've done before I've done headshots and, and portrait work like that in that capacity, but I don't, <laughs> I don't enjoy it. It doesn't fill me, fill me up. But what does give me joy in the whole photography community is taking photos of families. Like I, I light up there. I have a really hard time doing one person. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't work for me. Um, it's just not, not my cup of tea. So I know, I know that I need to be working in that niche. So from your goals, you work into your niche. Like what niche do you want to be in? And then I some people say niche. I don't know. Do you say niche or niche? I say both, I think. I, think. I like niche. I just think it sounds fancy. So yeah. I go with this. Um, then from there, I really like to dive into the why. Why are you doing photography? Um, and a lot of times people will say, uh, well, I'm good at it and it makes money, right? You know, what, what is like, why did you start being a photographer? Yeah. I mean, for me personally, it's uh, I'm a third generation photographer. So it was just something that inevitably I would fall into at some point. Yeah. I, I used to be a session musician for about 20 odd years. Um, but then in 2013, I sort of came full circle um, back into photography. And it, it was just something that I really enjoyed because it, it creatively fulfills me, actually. And despite the fact that I that I predominantly shoot headshots, um, I also do a number of other things. Like, for instance, this podcast is a good example. Um, yeah. But, you know, I enjoy shooting all sorts of different things. I mean, commercially, it's basically commercial photography, I think, is, is probably the best way to describe what I do, you know. So you said that you're a third generation photographer, so it just kind of like comes naturally, in a sense, um, and you enjoy doing commercial photography. But I would kind of argue that it goes deeper than that. And I'll use myself as, a, as an example. So I'd say I saw someone else doing photography, and I thought it would be an easy way to make a little bit extra money. And let's... I don't know what the the do what the money not good with the dollars and the merge <laughs> money, but I charged like thirty dollars a session when I first started to go like, oh, that's money. I didn't have a job. Yeah. I thought that was a great amount of income. My camera cost a hundred dollars. I mean, it was like nothing. It was like one of those little rebel can of rebels that was so cheap. I'm like, man, thirty dollars for an hour of work. That's awesome. So when I was getting babysitting. So that's where I started. So I'd say, Oh, I just it made some money and I I was naturally gifted at doing creative work but really that's it. i could do anything to be creative right i am a creative person at my heart at my soul i i can paint i can draw i can decorate i love doing diy there's a lot of things i could do that are creative that would make money but why was it photography that drove me into there and then i would ask you the same question if we were sitting down for this conversation like why did, did you come back to photography why is it photography is one of your main incomes it's, I think, you know, for me, it's really something I, I honestly, I grew up uh, surrounded by photography, you know, but lenses, cameras, um, you know, uh, my dad used to turn our bathroom into a dark room, you know, oh, so yeah. I, I still remember the smell of the chemicals and everything. And I'm just, I've always been fascinated by, um, by sort of capturing the moment, you know, um, and, and freezing time in a sense, you know, so, so from a creative perspective, really, um, people ask me, Ask me that a lot. It's like, how come you know you, you went from being a professional musician to to uh, you know being a professional photographer? And to me, it really doesn't make any difference. You know, it's just a creative thing. Like you start yeah. with nothing, you make something. At the end, you have something. So writing a piece of music is exactly the same thing as creating a photograph. You know, so yeah. so really, in that respect, um, it's you know it, it doesn't make much of a difference. What does make a difference, though, and this is the thing that I enjoy, is the fact that. Um, 
I find it in many ways I find it easier to make money in photographer in photography than in music. That's yeah. you know, um, and I'm more in control. Yeah, that's I think that's that's really what it boils down to. I I can agree with that, and I could agree also that creating music and creating a photo kind of go into the same thing for you. You said capturing a moment, like a moment in time, and I think a lot of music is capturing an emotion in that moment. It's like a song is like the emotion that you're feeling in a certain moment. Like when, if you were a songwriter, you wrote that song, you're capturing that moment, right? You're capturing a moment, but it's a visual moment for photography. Yeah. For me, I call this six degrees of why. So I start there and I ask you why, 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 why are you a photographer? Why do you think you're good at it? Go into, you give me an answer and ask you why again. We go a little deeper and I ask you why again, go a little deeper. So for me, it was, I wanted to, I thought I was good at it. And then, okay, why did I choose photography of all things? Like I wanted to freeze this moment in time for this family that is coming to me. And then I go a little deeper, like, why is that important to me? Why is it important that I freeze this moment in time? And then it would go into, well, I don't have a lot of photos when I was a kid with my mom. A little deeper, why is that important? And <laughs> not to get like too sentimental here, but maybe a little sentimental, it boils down to, I want to capture a moment in time and make it beautiful. Like life is crazy, right? Life is crazy. Having kids is crazy. It's not always pretty, but I want to take that moment and show you that it is beautiful. It is this moment that is meant to be captured. It is meant to be remembered. And your your life in that moment in time is beautiful. And that boils down to what my why in photography is. And your why is kind of the overarching theme of your brand. So I know that part. I know that it is important to me to capture the beauty of your life, even in the messiest moments. That's kind of where my brand starts. <laughs> Long story short, knowing your why helps you start to develop a brand. Okay. I mean, I there's another moment for me, actually, that's um, that I've always found really important. That really translates very well from music into photography. And that's, you know, there's this thing when, you know, let's say you write a piece of music and you then you know, somebody listens to it and you can see their reaction and how they react to to hearing that piece of music and that's ex that's very similar or almost exactly the same as when you know you create a headshot or a portrait for somebody it may be family portrait or you know a portrait of an individual and the moment they see the portrait there's 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 something that's like a light bulb that goes on you know there's some synapses firing in the brain um when they when they for the first time see the result and they kind of realize wow i didn't i didn't realize that you know that could be that good, you know, yeah. and it's, it's that moment um, that I've always been super attracted to, like it, it, no matter whether it was, you know, music or, or photography. So it's, it's those similarities for me that, that actually make the transition super easy. I've never really thought about it myself, actually, to be honest, yeah. to be honest with you. I think it's really beautiful knowing why you're doing something. And like you said, there's a lot of, you know, translations like going into music. I think you can know your why for any part of your life, why you're doing it or why you're doing whatever job you're doing, even if you're doing like a nine to five insurance adjuster job. Like my husband, that's what my husband used to do. There's a why for him because he wanted to have enough stability to raise his family, to support us, and but not so much that he had to work so hard that he uh, was never there. It's like he's there coaching sports and stuff. And I would argue that even though there's no like emotional attachment to the actual job, there's a why that he is there doing what he's doing. So, so what are the key, um, the key elements of a successful photography brand? Well, first of all, knowing your why, knowing how you're serving people. And then also what problem, what unique problem is it that you solve for your client? So we all have like a special sauce. We we're all different. You and I are different. Obviously we're in different niches. And then even someone who's in a family photography niche with me or in a portrait niche with you, we do something different. We solve a different problem than what that other person solves. And so communicating that to our clients is what's going to attract certain people to us, right? Do you know, do you know what your special, like what your special sauce is for commercial photography? I think I'm really good with people. I think that's, you know, I enjoy the interaction with people, which is why I don't shoot products. You know, I think uh, that's, that for me is, you know, during the <laughs> pandemic, uh, there was a, you know, there was a time when, of course, uh, photographing people wasn't exactly possible, especially over here in the UK. Um, and so, uh, you know, I did shoot some some products uh, during that time. And I remember thinking, man, 
this is like the most boring subject. Like that subject isn't, you know, I can't crack a joke. You know, <laughs> that right? subject isn't laughing back. It's like there's wow. no conversation going on. It's boring. So I kind of thought, man, I, you know, product photography definitely not a thing I'm going to pursue. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. So it's it's definitely it's to people interaction. I think that I that I crave really, and that's that's the thing that makes it um, makes it very enjoyable for me. And and I think I'm, I actually think I'm quite good at it. You know. And I bet you being personable on that level and like connecting with people make them feel more ca- more comfortable in front of your camera, which helps them loosen up and you're able to capture like a more, for lack of a better word, authentic side of themselves that maybe someone who is very like stoic and doesn't like crack jokes can't get them to be like more warmed up and feeling themselves, right? Absolutely. So- Absolutely. And it's, you know, it's... um. It's getting somebody to warm up to you is so important. And I think, to be honest with you, I think, you know, that's, at least that's what I've been told um, by clients is that's the thing that sets me apart maybe from from some some uh, competitors. It's the fact that I really feel like, you know, uh, they can really connect. And I, I put a lot of effort into that. I mean, I, I have a whole spiel that I go through at the beginning, uh, at the beginning of each session um, in order to allow my clients to to connect you know and 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 that's really important that I'd never I'd never do 20 minute headshot sessions because it just doesn't work for me you know right. there's no opportunity to connect so I do a little bit differently but um it seems to work obviously it's working for you and I would hope that you kind of like express that message onto your website I would imagine you have some sort of message that kind of explains to people that you like to connect with them and that's you know that's why you are special as a headshot photographer you know, funny enough, actually, I don't think I do. But that's a what? really damn good idea. There you go. We've learned one thing already. And there you go. <laughs> and then you can take your brain and you communicate it on your website. So I like to say that you're drawing people into you and you're also repelling them, right? So like, what if I were to tell you or your audience, I don't like ice cream? How how does that make you feel? Yep. Well, me personally, you don't like yeah. ice cream? Uh, ice cream. Well. Yeah. Uh, how does it make me feel? Uh, I'd be I'd be puzzled by that, I guess, because I, I always thought everybody likes ice cream. <laughs> right. Well, there I promise you there, and I've said it to people before. My God, I really like ice cream, and they're like, "Oh my gosh, me either!" And they're immediately drawn to me because they're like, at, like on a personal level, like, "Oh, you don't like ice cream either." I uh, uh, that's great. We both we both kind of connect on that level, right? And you, you're like repelled by that. You think, "Oh my gosh, this girl doesn't like ice cream. What's wrong with her?" I like it's cold. It, I like warm, melty things in my mouth. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I want ice cream. So you're doing the same thing with your brand. Like someone might come in and be like, I don't really want to like be schmoozed and warmed up and like have this like funny conversation with my photographer. I just want to get in there, get out, get on my day, you know? And so you're automatically repelling those people who don't want that. You know, that's actually, that's a really important point. Um, and that really, you know, it gets you to the point where you realize that not everybody is your clients, you know, not, not everybody's your customer. This, you know, there, there are different people out there that match better with, with, you know, somebody's personality. It's right. actually very similar to this podcast. You know, when, when we, when we uh, first got online, you know, we're talking about the fact that, that the camera tech podcast often is quite long, you know, sometimes it's over an hour or sometimes two hours, you know, who knows? Um, and I know that, you know, from conversations that I've had in the past with, you know, with people who listen to it, you know, some people go, oh, it's awesome. I can put it on during editing and it's great. You know, I listen to the whole thing. Awesome. And I also have had other comments where people said, like, oh, it's so long. I just need something, you know, short, precise and you know, concise and just hit me and that's it. And it's cool. You know, not everybody, not every, not everybody is shaking it up on a Camera Shake podcast. But, you know, if you are listening to this podcast, let me just, uh, let me just say that, then make sure you hit the like and subscribe button somewhere. There must be someone, no matter which platform you're, you're listening to, because that would really be awesome. <laughs> Anyhow, little, um. Especially if you like really long podcasts with great conversation. You have, you're a really good conversationalist. I can see that you like people because I see it in yeah. your podcast. But when I listen back, I'm like, those are just like so conversational and very natural. I love that. I love, I don't really prefer long episodes to listen to, but I am hooked and engaged in yours because they're such good conversations yeah i mean that's you know that's the thing um it, it really is just a conversation it's it's uh people would be surprised to learn how little prep goes into each one of those you guys send me nothing <laughs> no 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 no. there is prep there's prep but uh, it's not it's not as prepped as as, uh, as people might think it's certainly not scripted um but no but yeah. you know it's um 
I think it just comes out of out of an int- out of a genuine interest in the subject matter, and also uh, out of genuine curiosity, because you're talking to people who who are basically experts in fields that I'm not an expert in, like yourself, you know, for example, uh, when it comes to branding. It's just it's just interesting to have that conversation and to learn new things. And you know, as interesting as that is for me, I'd also hope that for our listeners um, and people who you know and viewers, uh, that that might be just as, as interesting and educational for them. Let me just ask you this question. Um, how can you, as a photographer, how can you ensure consistency um, across your brand? Like, you know, your website, uh, social media, for example, you know, marketing materials, whatever it might be. How, how do you how do you make sure that's all consistent? Well, first I start with the emotional, I guess I'm gonna call it emotional consistency first. Like I, I yes, having colors and having fonts and stuff like that is important, but I feel like it's more important to be like emotionally consistent for lack of a better word, emotionally consistent. And I know, I know what my brand is. I have like a, a brand map, like it's a like little grid of like what my, what my uh, positioning statement is, who I work with, what I solve, you know, so I can always go back to my brand board to see, okay, this is who I am. This is what I'm talking to. It's really easy for me because it all stems from my personality and like who I am as a human. So I don't have to do a lot of thinking about it. Right. But, you know, if you didn't want your personality to be a part of your brand, you'd have to just kind of keep going back to what your values are. We didn't talk about values, but I also like to figure out what your values are and why those values are like how they feed into your photography brand. But um, so, you know, making sure every message that you put on your website or on your Instagram or social media or everything, it all goes back to what your brand message is, like who you're trying to talk to, what message you're trying to get across. So it starts there. But then also, it does go into what your identity, your brand identity is. And that's your logo, your colors, your fonts, and all that. And I think that you have to go hand in hand. So I am, I would consider myself like a really fun, vibrant, well, I try to be <laughs> fun, vibrant, colorful kind of person. And so you would not see a bl- just a black and white, very elegant, eloquent, eloquent, yes, eloquent, like, brand identity. So my font is bold. I have lots of colors involved. Um, and so that's so automatically when you walk, you get onto my website, you're like, oh, this person is fun. <laughs> well, hopefully, hopefully I'm fun. I think I'm fun. And that's what really matters. Hopefully they think that I'm fun and they want to work with me and they can see it visually, not only in my images, but in my logo, in my colors, in my fonts and so on and so forth. And the two kind of marry together to create this like comprehensive brand. <laughs> So what do you think are the most common branding mistakes that photographers make um, and how, how how can they best avoid them? The most common branding mistake, I would think that just thinking your logo is what your brand is. That's almost everyone that I talked to who haven't really dove into this whole world of brand, branding and brand identity, they always think it's their logo. And you can't connect with people through just a logo. They want to connect with humans, especially we found that after 2020, I'd say when we were kind of locked up, I didn't know I was a people person until I was taken away from people. <laughs> but we are, we, we want to connect as humans. We want to be treated as humans. We want to make relationships and connections and not just, I'm not going to book someone just because they have a good logo. Maybe I'll go to Target. Oh, do you have Target there? Um, Not Target specifically as far as, far as the brand's concerned, but uh, we have like Walmart here, for example. They just, oh, yeah. uh, they just have, uh, it's called Asta over here, I think. It's it's the same thing. Well, it's not the same thing because Ah. we have a Walmart and a Target across the street, and I'm going to go to Target every day over Walmart because of when I walk in, how I feel. I'm going to get my coffee. I'm going to walk around. I'll spend way too much money, but I'm not going to do that at Walmart. When I go to Walmart, I'm going to go in and out and be done with it. Yes, so that's that's very similar to here in the UK. So I I see see exactly what you're saying. So some people are uh, Walmart people, and you have other people who are... Uh, target people, and then you probably have Kmart people as well, or something like that, right? I don't even know if we have <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but that's yeah, that's very similar over here in the UK. So we have a thing called Tesco, for example, and then we have something called Waitrose, and Waitrose is the more upmarket thing, and then you know Tesco is more the sort of you know middle of the road thing, and then we also have something called Aldi and Lidl, which is the kind of they're sort of the, the more inexpensive, I should say, um, yeah. kind of brand. You know, so yeah, it's very similar over here. Is Aldi groceries? Yes, yeah, they have all grocery stores. Yeah. We have Aldi too. And it is, it's, you go there if you want to save money. Exactly. Yeah, I love that. Um, and, you know, we have, I would go into like a whole thing for 
grocery stores here too because there's like a grocery store hierarchy as well or uh, you call them grocery stores what do you call your yeah we market? call them grocery stores supermarkets yeah groceries yeah sure i really like i really like how you know just a hop skip and a jump away we had different words for things and like our community and our culture is just a little bit different i really think that's really fun to kind of like figure out what do you call a grocery store yeah and... yeah yeah absolutely yeah i mean this this, this it's little things you know little everyday things um, that are just a tiny little bit different you know and sometimes it's uh what's hilarious it's like sometimes it's like for instance sometimes there are things like in american english that you know sometimes you guys use words that maybe we used to use in britain and i'm not british actually by any stretch of the information uh, the imagination, yeah. but but uh, you know so, some things, some words may have been words that you know we used to use like many decades ago, and now for some reason don't, and who knows why? Nobody knows why. Well, because the Americans started using it, so you gotta be. You gotta yeah, be a- I, you know that's an interesting thing. I had this discussion with my daughter, so um, you know we have uh, part of my family is Canadian, and my wife's Canadian too, so we have this uh, this transatlantic thing going on in Thanks. in our family, and so the the issue of of using different words and stuff comes up comes up a lot um and i was having a conversation just this weekend with with my youngest daughter and i you know i said like look the interesting thing is is that you know the american accent is actually if you would if you could time travel like 300 years into the past um in the southwest of of britain people would have sounded much more like american sound now and it's yeah. not that the Americans have American English has developed away from British English. It's actually the other way around, interestingly enough. So uh, she was really quite perplexed by that because that was like, well, I defer that. But that's true. That is really cool. No, I, I had no idea how American accent came came to be. I even know that from the South and then from the North, my husband's what we would call a Yankee in the South. And um, he, uh, we have different words for things. And so he grew up there and I grew up down here. And so I'll say something. He's like, what does that mean? Um, and that's always really fun because even just in our country, because it's really big, you know, we even have different words. That's, but going back to, you know, Target and Walmart or, you know, just your brand, like people are going to pick different stores to to go shop with, just like they're going to pick different photographers because they're going to, what experience do they want to get out of it to bring that full circle? Yeah, absolutely. No, it's absolutely, it's, that's, uh, it's, you know, it really, um, I can totally see that. It's the same thing here. My my mother in law will not be seen dead in Tesco's. <laughs> she's like a, she's a white drawers girl. <laughs> That's it. You know. but, yeah, exactly. So that would be the number one mistake is just thinking that your logo is going to do all that. I I don't go to keep on the same same example. I don't go to Target because they have a, a red bullet Target sign uh, logo. I go there because when I walk in there, I feel at home. I feel good whenever I'm walking around. I enjoy it. And that's why people are going to work with you. It's not because of you have a pretty logo. Um, It's because you are consistently giving this one feeling. It's how they feel when they work with you. And especially if you can keep that same feeling every time they work with you, hopefully you are, then that's going to keep them coming back. It's going to have them tell your friends, their friends. That's just how you're going to build a business around how you make people feel. So in some places, especially I guess in bigger cities here, you know, like I, I would I would assume in Dallas, um, you're know, just like in London, for example, you know this there's a very saturated market when it comes to when it comes to photographers. So how do you stand out in a market that's fairly saturated? First of all, not everyone has a brand, so they don't know what their brand is. So that helps a lot. Once once I created this brand, or I had this brand, I didn't create this brand. It already existed. It's whenever I figured out what my brand was and kind of leaned into it and started marketing to that feeling that people are going to get with working with me, that solution that I give them. And sorry, there's a kid coming. More or less, more or less, the way I make my families feel is um, I say, all right, I got, what is it? Well, I that. Oh, every day <laughs> life's big adventures captured is my like my tagline and so all these adventures and just like this raw messy everyday life is captured so i can take the craziest kid the most silly kid the kid who doesn't want to cooperate and i can create a beautiful image out of that you're not going to come to Brittany because you want to have a sit a photo that where my child sitting and smiling at the camera i'm not going to get that i'm not going to try to get that i'm going to get the kid being who they are in that moment and it's going to look really good 
might I say. So it's going to look good. So that's why people are coming to me to work with me. So when we start leaning into one, your niche, you know, I'm only working with families and kids. I'll do some things outside of that, but I don't necessarily market about it. You know, I'll do senior photos and teenagers and adults and things like that. But but more or less, I'm working with crazy kids who the, who cannot be contained. That's what I'm doing. And so people who have crazy kids who cannot be contained are going to come to me to work with me. And that's how you start setting yourself apart because it is a really saturated market here in D- Dallas. We are growing. I think we're one of like, the third biggest city in the U.S. now. It's getting pretty big and it's just growing and growing and growing and more photographers are coming and coming. But I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid about my business because I know people are going to keep coming to me because of this problem that I saw, because of the solution that I give them, all based on what my brand is. And I communicate it through my brand and my brand message. Let me just say a quick thank you to our sponsor, DVE Store. DVE Store's mission is to help you create better video and provide you with the tools necessary to explore your creativity. If you have any digital video equipment needs, whether that's camera equipment, audio gear or lighting, and much more, you can check them out at dvestore.com. Thank you to DVE Store for the high def video. And of course, you can find a link to DVE Store in the description. So it's interesting when you, you, know, you mentioned niche or niche for those, for those, for those listeners who say niche, whichever it may be. Um, it's interesting when you, when you mentioned niche because um, there are almost like two opposing attitudes to that. Um, on one side, you know, you very often hear it's really important to niche down. You know, you got to be really like very precise and very, you know, very narrow in your niche. Um, and on the other hand, you you very often hear that it's a better idea to to sort of spread out a little bit, you know, and and uh, create a little bit more versatility. What's your yeah. what's your opinion of that? I don't think there's anything wrong with being versatile. So you know, if you're, I feel like a wedding photographer and a family photographer are talking to two very different people, right? I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but I would say it's harder to have a marketing mm-hmm. plan to be talking to one group of people, you're going to have to be talking to the brides and you're going to have to be talking to the moms at the same time. And that's really hard to do all in under one roof. So I think if you want to be versatile, that's fine, but you're probably going to have to separate your brand a little bit to have like a really clear brand. On the other hand, maybe instead of it being niched in, your brand is versatile. Maybe you can create like a if you're able to, I think it'd be really hard to do. That's why I kind of steer people against having uh, being versatile, like for your brand's sake. But maybe it's the way you make your clients feel, and maybe you make them feel the same way whether it's their wedding or ma- whether it's their family session. So, for example, let's say you are just to be vague, I guess you're capturing the moment as it unfolds. I don't know, um, just off the top of my head. You can do that as a wedding photographer and as a family photographer. You just have to be a little bit more broad in your messaging. You know what I mean? So really it just comes down to it's harder to message to people when you have a really wide open scope of things. And I guess there's nothing to to keep you from actually setting up two separate brands as well. So if you you know if you like shooting weddings and you also like family portraits, you know, then having two websites and two separate brands, there's really nothing wrong with that. That doesn't necessarily interfere with each other. That might actually be possibly the better solution. I would think if you're going to do multiple things, I would have separate brands. For me, though, I might like multiple things. I'm just going to focus on the one thing that fills my cup up because I don't have the bandwidth mentally to run two different brands. I don't have the bandwidth to keep up with this website, that website, this social page, that social page. I just don't have it in me. And because I know what my goals are in life and my goals are to spend more time with my kids, to spend less time working, not going to have two separate brands. There it goes again, knowing what your goals are. It's always, it's often, you know, uh, especially people who are at the very beginning of their career, very often think, oh, but you know, if I if I specialize too much, then I lose potential income. Like for instance, you know, I want to be a hedgehog photographer, but if I get a call for uh, a family session, am I going to say no, you know, because that's not what I do. I don't only do headshots. Um, yeah. But but really, I think listening to what you're saying, it's really all about the messaging. So in other words, you know, if you get a request for a family session, if I get, I mean, this is what I do. Um, I occasionally get requests to shoot things that I'm, that I really don't appetize <laughs> at all. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, I do get those calls. And I, 
most most of the time, if I feel confident in it, um, I'll do them. There are occasions when I pass it on to people who I know will do a better job, and I think that's professional courtesy. You know, I, I actually did get a, a, a call for a newborn session the other day, and I am absolutely not the right person for that. <laughs> um, but I do know somebody um, in the area who's who specializes in that, and so I gladly refer that um, that potential client on uh, because I want to make sure they get good results. Um, but you know, but nevertheless, so. On the other occasion where I do work uh, that doesn't necessarily, uh, that's not necessarily in line with my brand, um, then I don't, ne- you know, I'll, I'll do it, but I, I won't necessarily shout about it. Definitely. So I won't necessarily use that as part of my messaging. So that's a way that I guess you can you can keep your branding clean and at the same time also don't necessarily have to, you know, um, uh, you know, deny work right. that comes your way. Oh. Yeah, I absolutely take on photo sessions that I don't necessarily specialize in. For example, I do a lot of, we call them seniors. It's the last year of of school before they go to college. Um, And so it's a big deal to have your photos taken, do senior sessions. I don't do senior photos. I think when sometimes when people hear senior, they think of like the old, older people. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people leaving school. (laughs) Um, and I don't do that, but since I am a family photographer, some of these families have been with me since they're, they're now graduates are, were very little. I've been doing this for like over 10 years. And so they're eight, you know, when I started working with them. So of course they're going to come to me to ask me to do that. I'm going to do it. And then what's been happening is that person referred their friend the next year who referred a friend the next year, who referred a friend the next year, who referred a couple of friends this year. So I have all these senior sessions that I'm doing and I'm absolutely not messaging about it. I'm not sharing it on social media. I'm just doing it. I'm getting word of mouth referrals and I'm going to take them because I do like to make money. <laughs> the, well, yeah, we all have to you know, pay the mortgage or, you know, pay yeah. the rent or not and buy food, obviously. Um, and, you know, I've, I've had I've had a few occasions where actually, you know, I got some uh, very lucrative um, job offers for, for things that I really didn't think, uh, you know, some somebody called me. It's probably like a year or so ago. Still at the end of the pandemic, called me to shoot to shoot his garden, and I'm like, "Where on where on my website did you see that?" Right, <laughs> and, you know. But you oh. know, it was uh, it was great. You know, it was a good day out. Um, now I think one of the one of the most common questions when it comes to you know uh, people setting up the new a new business in in photography is the question around pricing. I think, um, and so, so uh, you know, how how can a new photographer? How can you sort of incorporate your pricing s- strategy into your branding efforts? Well, personally, I think the more niched and the more specialized you are in something, and the more coveted you are. So, if people are really wanting to work with you because you have a specialized solution that you solve for people they're going to pay a lot of money to work with you. They're like, they solved this problem that I really need solved that I've never had solved with another photographer. So the fact that they can solve my issue, my photography issue, they're going to come to me and they're going to they're gonna hand over that money a lot easier than they would if I didn't have a message, if I didn't have a brand, if they didn't know what problem I solved for them, they're going to be a lot more likely to pay higher dollars. So first of all, that is one of the monetary things that having a brand can do for you. It can set you set you apart, set you up higher, put you a little higher than all these other photographers who don't have that messaging in place. Um and then what was your your question about pricing other than other than that? Like uh is it basic, yeah, really just how you incorporate it in, into your branding efforts. I mean I would I would guess that um you know just to come back to the target um uh you know, target versus what was it? Kmart no <laughs> Comparison. Walmart and Target for Walmart us. and Target, that's it. <laughs> um, you know, I, I guess Target in the US, just like, you know, Waitrose over here in the UK, um, they know very, very specifically who their target customers are. So, uh, you know, they know exactly that they're not pitching their their uh, their services or, or their products to people who are trying to save money and who are maybe, uh, you know, not looking to spend that much money. Um, they they can really quite happily ignore that part of the population, but they know very specifically who they're targeting um, their, you know, their products at. And so therefore, I guess the pricing really reflects that. Yeah. I will go to Target 
over Walmart, like I said, any day because when I walk in, I can get my coffee and get my coffee and I can walk around and then my kids like going to the toy aisle. It's just very clean. It's really easy to navigate and they do have higher prices and I am going to pay those higher prices rather than going to Walmart to save money where everything feels a little cluttered. I don't feel good being there. It's not fun. It's not enjoyable. <laughs> and they charge less prices. I'm going to pay a little bit more, just like I'm yeah. going to pay a little bit more like for organic food. I pay, you know, I'm, I'm, I am I buy all uh, mostly organic, but the result is that I'm eating cleaner food. So I'm paying a higher dollar because of this solution that it gives me a cleaner, cleaner food. Is organic a thing? <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And, yeah. One hundred percent. I mean, that's, that that's and that's that's really uh, because your pro you, your priorities are aligned with that. You know, so I, so your priority is to uh, to um, you know eat healthier food and therefore you're prepared to to pay higher dollar for it. Um, and likewise, of course, on the other end of the of the uh, of the market, where like in the UK we have these they called pound stores. I, I guess you get, do you have dollar stores? Is that a thing? Oh yes, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, they are obviously these sort of stores are clearly you know um, aimed at the the opposite end of the market, where where people's top priority is saving money, and and so they are prepared to you know um, put up with lower quality when it comes to food, for example, you know. Um, but but the priority is to save money, and so. So just you know, narrowing down your target customer mm -hmm. is is just vital. I mean, just like I think in photography, it's exactly the same thing. Like I, in the headshot realm, um, there are lots of different, lots of different types of customers. You know, there are those that um, that will not spend more than than sixty quid or pounds, which is probably the equivalent of what is the equivalent? Maybe eighty dollars, something like that. Oh, it's pretty, I think it's pretty similar right now. Yeah. Uh, so, I so you know, I get these, I get these requests sometimes, um, and it's like, you know, um, again, I don't, I don't. That's not my target audience, and that's not the work I do, and um, and so, so I very happily refer people on to somebody who who does sixty pound uh, headshots, and that's absolutely fine with me because that's not really those are not my clients, you know, that's fine. Um, but yeah, so pricing, it's it's one of these things. Well, and, and there's no regulation in pricing, so you can really just throw whatever dollar or ounce yeah. <laughs> whatever number out there that you want, and that's what people can pay you th theoretically. Um, and like you were saying, people who would pay a little bit less. Um, I had a client who has been using me for a few years. I did her previous newborn photos. I also do, in, in addition to family, I do a newborn as well. They kind of, kind of go hand in hand for me. Um, and she came to me this year when she had a baby. She goes, you're out of budget now. And then it's like, that's okay. I totally understand. Um, do what you got to do. Pay, you know, go with something that's in budget. She didn't value what the the product, the feeling, whatever. And that's totally fine. I'm not offended by that. Some people value the price. She got her photos back and uh, she shared them. And I was like, ooh, ooh, you sure did save some money there because the quality was a little bit different. And I can tell by looking at it that that person didn't necessarily know how to work with babies quite the way that I have what? developed working with babies and but that that's what was important to her is saving money for you know her family but also just capturing the moment right and so I'm not talking to those people who want to save money or I'm not trying to I'm trying to talk to people who who want the experience who want to know that they're in good hands whenever they work with me and that they're going to get a certain product or um a, what's it called a uh, outcome every single time because they know I'm consistent and they are willing to pay for the money for the experience and the consistency that I can offer them. And that in itself is super important because that then leads to positive feedback, which again, from a branding perspective um, is super important, I guess, because a testimonials and customer feedback is, is super important when it comes to establishing a brand. Yeah. And then you kind of go into the client experience and like how, how can they go, you know, work with you and how they enjoy working with you. And that comes from your brand. So I think that if you're just now starting a business or photography business specifically, and you're like, what do I do first? I would kind of start diving into your brand and figure out your brand doesn't have to stay the same acro across your entire career as a photographer. So you could start as one thing. I've certainly started as one thing, kind of like moved along to be something different and that's totally fine but having a brand knowing what you stand for and knowing what you give people and what feelings they have with working with you and what you can 
guarantee deliver like to your clients, um, I think that's the perfect place to start because everything else just kind of stems from your brand, your marketing, your client experience, like everything just kind of explodes out from there. So we've talked about, um, you know, a, a getting a getting a logo, you're finding your brand identity and so on, um, and, you know, setting up a website. Um, what we have talked about is the whole social media side of, of branding. <laughs> so, um, so how can a photographer use social media to build their brand and attract clients? So I recently took a very, like a two month break from social media to just to see if one, clear my head, <laughs> which was amazing. And I really enjoyed not being on social media. I'm back on it now. Um, and I'm trying to use it very judiciously, not spend a lot of time on it. So for me and what I'm trying to teach people to do, because the ROI for social media is not as high as like having a website and using blogs and things like that to get clients and also community, like having people refer you. So I try not to use social media to necessarily, you can, I try not to use it to build my business. I use it as like a supplement to my business to kind of connect with people one-on-one -on -one and share what's going on in my life so they can kind of like connect with me. So I work with moms a lot. And so I share my life being a mom a lot on social media. So my stories are all of me and my kids, what I'm doing and try to be like real, pretty authentic about what I'm showing. You know, my house is messy. Right now I'm recording this right now with you in my in my kids' playroom, at their Lego room. <laughs> Um, and so I would probably share that and just let them know, like be able to connect with me on that level. So yes, I'm going to use my fonts and graphics and I'm going to have a very consistent photo look and visually it's going to all be very consistent. But on the emotional side, I'm trying to connect with those people, my target audience, my target market by relating to them, by being a mom, by showing them my life. And people have said they really enjoyed that. Some people have actually said they booked with me specifically because of my stories on Instagram. They say, I looked at your stories. I really connected with you as a mom. Then I booked you. Then I went and looked at your photos and I liked your photos. But first I liked you. So that's my brand. And it's a lot easier for me to show my brand personally because it my brand is me personally. <laughs> if that makes sense. Like I am my brand and my brand is me. And I'm not trying to be something in my brand that that I'm not in my everyday, which is fine. If you want to be something different, maybe you wouldn't share. You're trying to be like a bit more luxury and on things. You probably wouldn't share your messy house with your messy life, with your messy Lego realm. That would not be what you're sharing, right? So you just have to know who you're talking to and what you want to accomplish with your social media. So when you were talking about the website, you also mentioned blogs. What's the importance of having a blog on your website? What's the importance? S SEO, search engine optimization. So um, going back to having a goal, right? So I have a, a goal for my life, but I also have goals each quarter for my business, which feed into the goals for my life. So maybe during the school year when my kids are in school, my goal is to book more newborn sessions so that I can shoot those sessions while my kids are at school, right? Um, and then during the summer, maybe my goal is evening sessions so that way my husband can watch the kids and I'm home with them during the day when they're off of school. So first I have to figure out what my goal in my life is and then what my goal in my business is to achieve those goals. I'm really big goal oriented love goals kind of person. So then my blogs will give feed into that goal. So if I'm trying to book more newborn sessions, I'm going to post a lot more blogs based on newborn sessions for SEO purposes, search engine optimization. Google loves when you post new content, and so they they are going to be more likely to boost you up into their special algorithm. So if you're posting blogs on a consistent basis, like once a month, twice a month, once a week, it's going to be more likely to show you to people when they're searching for Dallas family photographer or London family photographer, whatever it is that they're looking for, it's going to be more likely to show you up because you're putting out fresh content, which Google likes and you're using SEO optimized words and feeding into that, you are showing sessions that you want to do more of so people would see more of those sessions and search for more. <laughs> so in other words, really, you, you're basically putting content onto your website um, that will then be trawled and found by Google, which then basically promotes that content to anybody who's searching for that kind of thing 
in that particular area. So if somebody's, in my case, if somebody's looking for headshots in the uh, West London area, um, if I write blogs about that, then that content would be filtered out through through Google and it would pop up on somebody's in somebody's search results. So that makes perfect sense. My long, thanks for, thank you for condensing my long winded answer. <laughs> How long do you hear about that? What is it? That's the thing. I mean, it's, you know, it's um because I hear that all the time. So people say, oh, yeah, but blogs are dead, you know, and at least that's so like 2004 or something like that. But it, it really, you know, from a purely from a business perspective, it makes perfect sense because you're just, you're just, um, you know, basically jamming all these keywords into, into copy on your website that then has the potential of being found. It makes perfect yeah. sense really boils down to it's fresh content every month or every week that Google really enjoys. Do I think people are reading my blogs? Absolutely not. Like, I don't think people are sitting down reading my blogs. I don't, and I'm, I'm not under any impression that they are, but Google loves to read and Google loves it when you share a lot of words. So Google's gonna share you. And I'm getting a lot more since I stopped using social media. I knew this was going to come back around. Since I stopped using social media for a few weeks, I was able to focus more so on my blog. I got a lot of website hits. So I got a lot of bookings from my website. And I would, I always ask them, how did you find me? I'll say from your website, from Google. And that's what I want because it's working for me while I sleep. And that's why I said, social media doesn't have the same ROI as blogs and your website does because you have to post on social media every single day in order to keep getting bookings or contacts or. And you know, you mentioned something, um, you hit on something really super important because, because uh, again, uh, you know, another, uh, very common question is like, how can you actually measure your your the success of your branding? And of course, by just asking that simple question, like, where did you hear about me, or where did, how did you find me? Um, that is so important to get that feedback, so you can actually learn which ones of your marketing efforts what? are successful. I have a, a leads tracker, uh, so I it's like a, a Excel spreadsheet and. I put every time someone contacts me interested about a session, I, I put where they found me. So if they found me on Instagram, by Google or by a friend or however they found me. And I can see where these people are coming from. And like 75% of them are, well, most of them come from my email list. Let's, there's like, there's even a whole nother part we can go into with email lists, but a lot of them come from my website, get onto my email list and then live there and then very few maybe less than 10 percent are coming from my instagram these days it used to be most people were coming from instagram but i i didn't want to keep living my life having to post every day in order to keep these leads coming in i wanted to be asleep booking sessions while i'm sleeping not having to worry about it so much <laughs> that's the dream quite literally yes <laughs> <laughs> so you hit on uh, on email lists um that's a that's a really interesting um topic in its in itself but just in a nutshell like how do you how do you create an email list and what do you do with it well first you have to have an email service provider so you don't want to have to just copy emails and then write it you know write each email into your your email delivery google or whatever you use gmail so you have an email service provider i use flowdesk i don't know if you've heard of flowdesk and then there's there's mailchimp there's convert kit there's all different kinds which basically you have all the emails entered in for you and then you type up an email and your email service provider sends it out for you in theory you'll have someone who you'll have an email service provider that guarantees delivery um sometimes it'll go to spam sometimes it'll get bounced and for many reasons but you want those emails to land in their inbox because unlike instagram people are going to see that right they have to one choose to give you your email address so that's a big deal. I'm not going to give my email address just to anybody because I don't like getting drunk mail. And then they are automatically guaranteed to see that, assuming it doesn't go into your spam folder. But with Instagram, maybe like five, three percent of people are seeing what you're sharing. With email, it's closer to a hundred percent that are seeing what you're what you're sharing with them. And so, how do you collect people's email addresses? Are they just existing uh, existing customers? Clients. Um, I always send an email address or an email out after session. Hey, join my email list. Um, sometimes I'll I do a lot of mini sessions during the fall. Falls are a busy time for family photographers. People want like boom, boom, fast photos, and so I've gotten to the point now where my mini sessions book up in June for October, and so people want to be on my email list to make sure they get booked. <laughs> Otherwise, if they're 
if they're not on my email list, they're not getting a spot. So that one, you know, the incentive to actually get a session, sometimes I'll say, hey, if you want access to a Black Friday deal, which is a Thanksgiving day after Thanksgiving sale that is like big in the US, um, then hop on my email list. Or, hey, if you just want news and updates, hop on my email list, you know, just asking people really is how I've done it. If you're not, I don't, let me back up there. You can also do like freebie opt-in. So like give them like a guide or like a how to pose for your family sessions, what to wear kind of guide. So you, they would give you their email and then they would be sent that guide. That's one way. I, I really haven't used that to build my family photography side of business. That's how I build my coaching business. I sent out a freebie. I have a pro- shameless plug here. I have a productivity freebie. It says how to run your business in 15 hours a week or less. It's a freebie. It's a PDF. They give me their email address. I send them this how to run their business in 15 hours a week or less. So in theory, you could do that with your family photography if you have, or portrait photography or whatever other kind of photography you did. But personally, I just asked for emails and that's how I built that side of my email list. And then how, how often um, would you email your email list? For family photography, I do once a month. Um, and that's just because I don't have a whole lot to say. I, I think if I was getting emails from my photographer four times a month, I'd probably be like, okay, I'm, it's time to leave this list. So I do it from that point of view because I know my audience, because I know my brand, because I know what people want from me. And that's what they want. They don't need four times once a week emails from me. On the my education side, I send once a week emails because that's what people want. They want tips. They want frequent and regular information from me. So... I think when you're a photographer, unless you have like a lot of information to share with people, honestly, I'd say once a month is plenty at minimum once a month, just because you're keeping your name in their, in their mind. If you have something that you need to sell, if you have sessions that you want to get out there, then they're automatically going to see it, which they would not see on social media as likely. They're more likely to see it in email. Fantastic. Now, how important would you say is, is networking and building relationships? Um, within within the industry for photographers? It's the number one most important thing. So do you want, should they build photography, photographer to photographer relationships or client to photographer relationships? Well, actually both. Um, I, I would say that, I mean, for me personally, um, you know, building relationships within the photography industry has helped me a lot. And if I just, if I just take this podcast as an example, you know, uh, it's it's really helped me a lot um, to to basically raise the profile of 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 this podcast. You know, not only not only because it's allowed me to get you know more interesting, uh, maybe more high profile guests on the show, um, but also because it's it's just reached a wider audience because the guests have been more interesting. I guess mm-hmm. you know, so it's a it's a full circle sort of a thing. Yeah. So in that respect, it's it's worked. But the, uh, the other thing. That to be honest, I only started uh, the whole networking thing during the pandemic, and that's because we were all, you know, confined to our houses and couldn't really do very many sessions. And so I thought, um, many, and also many, because before the or prior to the uh, to the pandemic, I used to work with a lot of corporate clients. So um, one of the things I used to shoot a lot were conferences, for example. And of yeah. course, when the pandemic hit, all of that went down the pan, and conferences yeah. were no longer happening. And so I, I then, you know, I realized that, um, that you know, I, I live here in just outside of West London, and my clients are predominantly, you know, international corporates, but I don't really know any local businesses around in my area at all. And so I started, I started joining the network, networking groups and getting to know people, um, because I thought, well, you know, if, God forbid, if we're ever in a similar situation in the future, um, then at least I'll have almost like a fallback where I can work with, you know, or where I'm known to local smaller businesses, which can make up for that shortfall. And so that that was a, that was a strategy that I pursued um, since then. And and to be honest, it's actually worked really. It worked out quite well. Yeah, I think I think networking is the number one way to market your business. It is more effective than social media. It's more effective than email lists. It's more effective than your website uh, because you're, like I said earlier, you're creating relationships and that's what people really want is they want to know someone. They want to connect to someone on a deeper level. They want to see someone's face, especially after the pandemic. I think we all started kind of 
craving relationships, right? And so I think your number one source of marketing for your business is going to be networking. You know, um, getting me as a family photographer, I'll do things like do preschool photos for one of my kids' schools. I'm making a little bit of money from that. I'm not by me. I definitely undercharge for that because I'm not very good at it, but people enjoyed it and they booked me for a family session. So um, that was my way of networking there for my son who's in uh, grade school. I took free photos of an event they had and the parents just gushed over them. But I am building a community to people. I'm not going to go out and talk to local, no, local companies and businesses necessarily because that's not going to push my family photography business forward. But that's really smart. You as a headshot photographer, you're going to talk to these corporate businesses because that's who your ideal client is. Mine is families and moms. And so that's how I have to connect with them. Uh, recently, I in my email newsletter, I uh, titled it, Want to Have a Play Date? And I invited my 400 subscribers for my family photography to join me on a play, uh, at a park for a play date. And a few joined me. And so we were able to make that connection. Um, it's actually some that I had never worked with before. They were just on my email list. So that was cool because I was able to connect with them and they are probably more likely to think about me when it comes time to book a family session. They're like, oh, Brittany, I went to the park with her over some photographer that they just saw on the internet, right? Because we have that personal connection. And then they're going to refer their friends to me who are going to refer their friends to me and so on and so forth. So I think networking is absolutely the most important piece of marketing advice anyone could ever, ever do. Awesome. So remember who your ideal client is and try and network in those circles. And that'll, it'll be, it'll turn your business into a gold mine, I would say. <laughs> it will. It, it's got to, it's going to be building your business while you're sleeping, which like you said, is the, the absolute dream. Fantastic. Get... <laughs> if there's one final top tip that you could give um, photographers who are either um, thinking about setting up their photography business and you know and creating their own brand or maybe photographers who are already established but uh, want to kind of reinvigorate their brand what would that number one top tip be i would say figure out why you're doing what you're doing i think it all stems from that why uh do the six six degrees of why um what do we call it exercise so do the six degrees of why exercise ask yourself why you started doing photography why to the next question why 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 do that six times you're going to come up with the the underlying why of your your entire that's not going to change the why you started photography is never going to change and so even if maybe your niche changes or if your ideas behind how you want to capture it changes your why is always going to be there and it's going to be like that underlying driving force behind your photography business and how you connect with people and how you go about building your business so i would say figure out why you're a photographer there you have it, folks. Brittany, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, folks, that's all for today. This was great fun. And if you liked this episode, go and check out Brittany's podcast, Capture the Chaos, over on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and the like for a whole boatload of useful tips. Also, let me recommend another episode. Episode 129, How to Build Your Business and Stay Creative with Ivan Wies. Ivan Wies? Ivan Wies. That's another killer episode. Anyhow. Uh, and for those of you who are listening to the audio version of this podcast, uh, did you know that there's a fully fledged video version over on YouTube with plenty of examples of our guest photography in full Technicolor? All you have to do is go over to YouTube, search for Camera Shake Podcast, and you'll be able to watch all past episodes on there. And if you have any suggestions or feedback, we'd love to hear it. Uh, your comments are incredibly valuable to us and help us improve our content, so please don't hesitate to share your thoughts. Remember to hit the like button, ring that bell, and share with your friends. You can help us reach a greater audience all over the world. Once again, thank you for listening and watching, and I'll see you next Thursday.